Hello everybody and welcome to Ancient Architects. In the town of Zayet El Ariane, located between Giza and Abu Sir in Egypt, is a necropolis referred to by the same name, almost directly west of the ancient city of Memphis. It is famous for having two pyramids, one known as the Leia Pyramid, believed to have been built in the Third Dynasty during the reign of Kaba, and the unfinished pyramid or Pyramid of Baca which belongs to a king with an illegible name. The unfinished pyramid, also known as the Northern Pyramid of Zayet el Ariyan, has a base of around 200 metres in diameter. So, compared to the Great Pyramid of Giza, which has a 230 metre diameter, it is believed to have been a very large pyramid indeed, that wouldn't have been out of place on the Giza Plateau. I say it is believed to have been large, because the upper parts of the structure are not present, and many believe it was unfinished, as opposed to being destroyed. The structure has a perfectly orientated, 105 metre long north-south corridor that leads directly to a chamber or pit precisely under the vertical axis of the structure. The chamber measures 11.7 metres by 24 metres, or 38 by 78 feet and is perfectly orientated on an east-west axis. It is also a massive 21 metres deep in the ground. The corridor and the chamber are carved out of the natural limestone. The corridor is incredibly steep, with a horizontal section about halfway down. The walls of both the chamber and the corridor are smooth, which, granted, isn't too much of a difficult task as it was made from natural limestone. But interestingly, The floor of the chamber is lined with three courses of giant pink granite blocks. Each block probably weighs between 30 and 40 tonnes, although some estimate they are up to 100 tonnes. They are 3 to 4 metres long and around a metre thick. The granite floor was extremely well polished, to the point where it would have almost been reflective, as noted by Italian excavator Alexandra Passanti. This is a remarkable feat in itself, not to mention the fact that the huge amounts of granite came from 700 kilometres away, in Aswan. And towards the western end of the chamber is the most curious feature of all, an oval tub cut into one of the granite blocks of the foundation. Although there are no internal photographs, it is believed to be around a metre deep and very finely polished. Egyptologists refer to it as a sarcophagus, but this is clearly not the case. Barsanti, who excavated the unfinished pyramid, found the so-called sarcophagus closed, with its perfectly dressed cover in place, made of a different type of granite, I should add. And although some false, unsubstantiated reports say human remains were found inside, it was in fact empty, except for a black residue that coated the bottom 10 centimetres. As stated, when it was found, the so-called sarcophagus was also completely covered over and protected by a layer of clay and several blocks of well-laid limestone. It is believed that around 4,200 metres squared worth of limestone blocks weighing 3 to 4 tonnes each were pushed into the pit from above. The contents of the oval container was clearly meant to be protected or blocked forevermore, but why? The cover being of a different type of granite and the fact that blocks were crudely thrown into the chamber from above says to me that this certainly happened at a later date. But what were they protecting or hiding? Egyptologists say this was probably a sort of ritual from the tomb owner's successor to mark the end of the building project as the person it was built for died before completion. But this just doesn't sit right with me. Interestingly, Barsanti thought there was more to this structure because after a heavy torrential rainstorm during the excavation, he and his team expected to find the chamber full of water. But it had in fact all drained away, almost immediately. He was therefore convinced there was another chamber below. Unfortunately, Barsanti died soon after, and excavations never resumed. So do we know who the structure belonged to? Barsanti did find several marks of a king on blocks in the corridor, and they are probably still in situ today. The king's cartouche consisted of two hieroglyphs, the second one being the sign for Ka, 
but there is no consensus of the reading of the first hieroglyph, as only sketches by Barsanti exist. It also seems to differ slightly in various sketches, and there are a range of interpretations, including Keba, Bika, Shenaka, and Nefaka. Some even thought that the first hieroglyph was a giraffe, an animal that was seen as wise with shamanistic powers. Jürgen von Beckerath and George Reisner believed that the pyramid was planned as a tomb of a prince named Baka, who was the son of King Chidefre. Aidan Dodson, however, believes the pyramid was planned as a tomb of another son of King Jedefere, named Prince Setka. Dodson, Beckerath and Reisner's link to sons of Jedefere does make sense, as the pyramid is so similar in appearance to the one dedicated to the king at Abu Ruwash. It too contained an oval sarcophagus, and apparently a dedication tablet to Jedefere was found by Basanti in the stairwell of the pyramid at Zayet al-Ariyan, although many think this was not true, as the artefact was never seen again and its discovery was never officially published. But the main problem we have with the structure at Zayet al-Aryan being dedicated to one of the princes is that the name is found inside a cartouche, and a prince's name would never be inside a cartouche unless he was king. Therefore, the name inside the cartouche is certainly not a son of Jedefere. These countless arguments over the name are actually not very helpful and certainly don't help us in understanding these structures. Whatever the truth, the uncanny similarities between the structure at Zayet el Ariyan and the one at Abu Rawash certainly point to the same architect. Firstly, both structures have the same open trench underground chamber formation. Secondly, the corridors of both structures have a perfect north-south orientation. And finally, it is known that the Abu Ruwash pyramid is strongly associated with the star Sirius, and various repeated inscriptions found at the unfinished pyramid at Zayet el Ariyan show that the name of the monument ended in star, which star is so far undecipherable. A number of Egyptologists, however, do doubt that the two structures are 4th dynasty in age, and therefore many believe that neither structure had any association to Jedefere. Granite floor coverings, for example, were used until the end of the second dynasty, and shaft-like tombs under a pyramid with a north-south aligned corridor were a pre-fourth dynasty tradition. I think that the so-called experts need to look much further back into history. For example, there was a pre-dynastic ruler named Seca, who could also be responsible. Granite also lines the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid, and it is clear to me, and to many, that this structure was built before dynastic Egyptian history. But what were the structures built for? Well, much like the Great Pyramid, they were certainly not tombs. The oval opening and lid have absolutely no resemblance to any sarcophagus in Egyptian history, and the one at Zayat el Ariyan had a strange black residue inside, which was certainly not human remains. Looking closer at the pictures from inside, the Pyramid of Baca also had a ledge or a ridge six feet above the ground inside the main chamber, which would have certainly had a function. There is also a ledge or a ridge inside the structure at Abu Ruwash, slightly higher up. These structures are now ruins, but looking at the evidence available, I can't help but think that they were industrial monuments, and, like the Great Pyramid of Egypt, I would suggest they were pre-dynastic in age. After Basanti's death in 1917, the Pyramid of Baca was neglected until 1954, when it was used as part of a set for a movie, Land of the Pharaohs. The rubble and sand were removed, and the movie gives us some of the best pictures of the site, which has been off-limits to archaeologists as it is now part of a military restricted area since 1964. The original necropolis is now overbuilt with military bungalows, and the corridor and chamber of the pyramid have sadly been used as a rubbish dump. The current state of the pyramid is unknown, but it is likely to be disastrous. Apart from what I have already mentioned, very little is actually known about the structure, and it is extremely unlikely we will learn any more if you look at how the site looks today. The Abu Ruwash structure is certainly the best chance we have to understand it, but even this isn't in the best state of preservation, and compared to the other pyramid sites in Egypt, it is relatively neglected. 
This so-called pyramid is only around 12 courses high around the descending shaft, and it is quite a coincidence that both so-called pyramids were almost identical and both were conveniently unfinished. Therefore, it is my opinion that neither site was ever built to be a pyramid. The one at Abu Rawash also has an enclosure wall, which you would think would be the final thing you'd add if you were building a pyramid and heaving large stones to the site. The fact that there is an enclosure wall, to me, says that the site was finished, and, as I stated earlier, it was for a more industrial purpose. So, I'm going to put my neck on the line and try and give this site a new interpretation. But, with little chance for new excavation, I admit I cannot substantiate my claims. But here goes. I believe that the key to understanding these structures is the anomaly noted by Basanti, that gallons of flood water disappeared below the structure at Zayet al-Ariyan, after a night of extreme torrential rain. The so-called sarcophagus looks almost pipe-like, and the lid, being of a different type of stone, says to me it is likely a later addition. I believe the structures at Abu Rawash and Zayat al-Ariyan are in fact part of a larger project, which centred on the Great Pyramid at Giza. I've said in a couple of other videos how I believe that part of the function of the Great Pyramid was to act as a water pump, to pump water from the Nile through the cavernous limestone bedrock to stop the desertification of Western Egypt, which was a real event and a real humanitarian problem between 3000 and 3500 BC. What I didn't say in these videos is where the water finally emerged from, but now I may have the answer. Maybe the oval sarcophagus in each structure at Abu Rawash and Zayat al Ariyan were actually outlet pipes, as water was pumped from the Great Pyramid, flooding the cavernous limestone to fill the natural aquifers of Egypt. It is no surprise that the structure at Abu Rawash was built high on a hill, the optimal place where you would want water to emerge from if you are going to use it for the surrounding landscape. The reason why the floodwaters noted by Basanti disappeared under the Pyramid of Baca is because the water drained away through the underlying caverns that connected it with the Great Pyramid Pump. Maybe the chamber was originally allowed to flood, to water the landscape, but then the structures at Abu Rawash and Zayat al Ariyan became reservoirs. The chamber and corridor would have gradually filled up, and the water would have then spilled out down the hillside. The causeway may have been a later addition, to direct overflow water back to the Nile. Maybe the colossal granite lid was actually a plug, used to seal off the outlet pipe if there was enough water in the area, or the reservoir was full. Interestingly, there is a pit found in the chamber at Abu Rawash, as pointed out in the brilliant documentary The Pyramid Code. Maybe this pit that goes downwards below the chamber was actually originally connected to the outflow pipe. It is important to add that these two sites are not the only unfinished pyramids in Egypt. There are other structures that have a similar layout as those at Abu Rawash and Zayat al Ariyan. I think all of these structures, together with the Great Pyramid, were originally one water system. There are, of course, a number of problems with this theory. Did the sarcophagus, my so called outlet pipe, actually have a bottom? Reports on the structure are conflicting. Some say it was a metre deep but as the granite block it was carved into was only a metre deep itself, maybe the hole ran straight through the block. Today, the proposed outlet pipe at Abu Rawash has been removed, and the one at Zayat al-Ariyan is inside a military zone, under piles of rubbish. The theory can never be proved one way or another, but to me, this makes more sense than it being a tomb. To add one more piece of evidence to my theory, there is also one other giant stone structure and plug in Egypt, located at Abu Ghraib. It is located in an isolated area, reached by walking through a mango grove. It was once home to the largest obelisk in the whole of Egypt, and next to it was what is called the Crystal Altar, an enormous finely carved quartz rock with a square hole in the centre. Inside the hole is a perfectly cut six-foot circular plug. 
It is a structure totally different to anything else in dynastic Egyptian history. Hakim Awiam, an indigenous wisdom keeper and archaeologist in Egypt, says that the circular plug is indeed a lid to a shaft about 180 feet deep, which reaches the level of the groundwater. He says there is still running water at the bottom of the shaft, and you can even feel its movement when you place your hands on the altar. I'm sure there will be many questions or comments about this video. My theory that in pre-dynastic times the Great Pyramid was a water pump and the numerous unfinished pyramids were outflow pipes is one that is in its infancy, and I admit it is a work in progress. Many people think that going to so much effort for the sake of water is a silly idea, but water is the life force of the planet and of humanity, and we know that in pre-dynastic times in Egypt the desert was rapidly expanding. If something wasn't done, the population centres of Egypt may have had to have been abandoned, but instead, I believe they looked at fixing the problem, most likely with the help of the technologically advanced invading people from Mesopotamia. I still need to look closer at the other two pyramids at Giza, as well as Egypt's many other structures to see how they all fit together into my hypothesis, if they do at all. If we don't hypothesise, we don't get any closer to the truth. Maybe all the giant structures in Egypt are just old dynastic tombs of pharaohs and I'm clutching at straws, or maybe I'm a step closer to the truth. I don't think the structures at Abu Ruwash and Zayat al Aryan were ever pyramids. I do, however, believe they were outflow locations for groundwater that was pumped through the cavernous limestone from the Great Pyramid, and hence they were reservoirs, possibly with a flat roof as pictures seem to indicate but there is no proof there was ever a pyramid structure above. In later history, maybe by the 4th dynasty, the Great Pyramid as a pump was out of use, and the water at the outflow locations had receded. Maybe the giant oval holes were viewed by the people with superstition. Maybe they were used in rituals, and the dark residue within the hole relates to that. Maybe it was sealed up, cemented and covered over as people thought it was the entrance to the underworld. Who knows? Yes, there are lots of ifs, buts and maybes, but people such as Graham Hancock and John Anthony West have taught me to have an open mind, and to not just accept a history that is clearly untrue. Thank you very much for watching this episode of Ancient Architects. If you enjoyed the video, please subscribe to the channel, please hit the like button, and please leave a comment below. Thank you very much.